Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Houston Ensemble YouTube channel. Thank you for being here. I've got something very interesting that I want to go through today. I am talking about the Universe 25 experiment slash experiments ran by John Calhoun. Now, the reason that I'm talking about this is because I think that it's somewhat relevant as well as insanely interesting. Uh, maybe you've heard about it before, but... It seems that it is relevant for our society today. It might not be exactly as we are, but it is something to, to be aware of. And John Calhoun did this experiment thinking about man, and I'll get into that here. This uh, study that I'm going off of was published in 1973. And just to start off, this is a little image from John in the universe, in the utopia he created. The background is that he starts with four pairs of mice and colonizes a utopia and basically wants to see what will happen as long as they have food, water, bedding, and plenty of space. He thinks it's a utopia and the goal is to just see how the mice progress in this utopia. He takes away all factors of death and I'll get into those here momentarily. Here's another image of John in the Utopia. And here is our title from the study that I'm using. It's Death Squared, the Explosive Growth and Demise of a Mouse Population. And what's interesting is that it's at the very end of the video, but Death Squared has a very specific meaning. And once I read it, I was like, wow, very cool. But let's actually get into it. This first paragraph, this is the first paragraph of this study, and I think it's really, really, really interesting. I shall largely speak of mice, but my thoughts are on man, on healing, on life and its evolution. Threatening life and evolution are the two deaths, death of the spirit and death of the body. Evolution, in terms of ancient wisdom, is the acquisition of access to the tree of life. This takes us back to the white, first horse of the apocalypse which with its rider set out to conquer the forces that threaten the spirit with death further in revelation we note to him who conquers i will grant to eat the tree of life which is in the paradise of god and further on the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations now i didn't get into all the biblical parts but in revelation there are the four horsemen which represent four factors of death sword famine pestilence and death itself um and he takes those and puts them into ecological terms which is shown in this table here and in ecological terms we have emigration resource shortage inclement weather slash cataclysms boxed into one, uh, you know, regarding famine, disease, and predation. And, you know, as you see in the table here, those are paralleled. So he wants to get rid of all the factors of death, thus creating utopia, to see what will happen to the mice and how it relates to man. Initially, John started the universe with four pairs of 48 day old mice and they were left to get adjusted to each other and then reproduce once they were adjusted to each other they had a rapid increase in population growth doubling the population every 55 days as the population grew uh, they developed into different broods now the graph you're seeing here is the histories of populations that started with four pairs of mice and as you can see you reach a peak and then you reach a decline basically john's goal was to fine-tune the experiment every time and he did this experiment 25 times spoiler alert they all led to the same demise 
regardless. But there are a few factors that could change that, and I will get into those later. Here we have the organization of the brood groups in the Utopia. Now, there were 14 different groups. Each had a different amount of babies, ranging from 111 offspring to 14, even though there was an equal amount of food and water and space. Calhoun notes that the productivity of a group may be taken as an index of its social status. So there are more dominant social niches in certain parts of the utopia and that just kind of arranged itself based on the productivity of a group in this graph they took the highest producing brood and the lowest producing brood and ranked them 1 through 14 you can see it here uh, number one producing 111 is at the very top the 14th group is at the very bottom producing 14 and they found that the most dominant male in the brood produced the most young thus uh, creating the social hierarchy slash social index during this time period john notes that the resources were exploited to the most that they had been aka the mice were eating and drinking the most and using the paper for bedding creating nests uh, more than they ever had thus creating the highest population. But this is when we get to the plateau, and this is considered the end of phase B. And at day 315 after colonization and continuing for 245 more days, the total population grew at a much slower rate, doubling only every 145 days rather than every 55 days. When we reach this plateau of production, we start to see the eventual decline. Obviously, they have enough resources, they have food, water, security, but that doesn't exactly mean a good life. So in nature, when there are more young than necessary to replace the dying, the ones that don't find a social niche usually emigrate out however in this universe there wasn't anywhere to go for those who didn't fit in a social niche thus the males who remained did contest for positions in the hierarchy but the ones that failed withdrew physically and psychologically according to calhoun and they became very inactive and aggregated in large pools in the center of the universe so because the complex social skills were messed up we had many non-reproducing females as well as males and these two groups these male and female groups were dubbed as the beautiful ones they were called that because all they did was sleep eat drink and bathe they did not have any scars on them like the majority of the other mice living in the universe uh, because they didn't get into fights and they really just ostracized themselves into one part of the universe. Even when mice were taken out of the universe study at a later point in time and put into a low density population to see what would happen, they still did not have the capacity to develop a social hierarchy or breed. And this is showing that something really happened to them as they were initially brought in or because they were not brought up correctly by the mother in the scenario even when paired with the proper sexual partner the mice still did not reproduce and this is something that's really interesting i want to talk about this essentially equation that john calhoun writes at the end of this study and it took me a second to understand it, so I'm just going to kind of read it out and we'll talk about it for a moment. Mortality slash bodily death equals the second death, which is officially dying. The f remember, the first death is spiritual death. Okay, mortality, bodily death equals second death. Drastic reduction of mortality equals death of the second death, which equals death squared, which equals the death squared like that 
Death squared leads to dissolution of social organization, which equals death of the establishment. Death of the establishment leads to spiritual death, which equals a loss of capacity to engage in behaviors essential to species survival, which then equals the first death, therefore, Death squared equals the first death or the death of the spirit. I thought that was really, really interesting that he could get all the way down to that point. And I do think that it makes perfect sense. Putting it in human terms, uh, my first question was death of the establishment. Does that really equal death of the spirit? But I think what he's getting at is that more so the destruction of natural humanity or taking us away from our natural state is what would create a death of the spirit below that in the study he has this proverb right here which says happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding wisdom is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her all her paths lead to peace. And I thought that was really good. I think that the study, though it is about mice, is very much about humans as well. And I would like to talk about that, as we said in the very beginning. In the beginning of the study, he said, I'm actually thinking about man, although I'm studying mice. And... I believe that we are really starting to see this play out today. We're seeing this in that we do have excess, at least here in the United States and then most, you know, most first world countries. We have excess. We have too much. At later portions in the study, you see the males essentially becoming weak and the females taking over and then hurting the children. And in some sense, we're actually seeing this today, too. We are seeing a, a decline in masculinity. And obviously, that's been very much in, you know, the cultural zeitgeist at multiple points. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about toxic masculinity. And I think that that might be a totally different thing. But to totally describe masculinity as something that's toxic is a horrible idea and will get rid of the natural balance that is found in nature and that's why we have a yin and yang balance we have a feminine and a masculine a masculine and a feminine it does not work if there is an imbalance or if the males are weaker or if the females are all like men it doesn't work like that moreover we can see that in a mere sense when populations of young mice are brought up in the improper way, the outcome is not good. AKA, you know, in a broken, we'll call it a quote unquote broken household, uh, the mice did not learn how to be social. They didn't learn the skills necessary to move on with their life. And we see a lot of that today as well. We see that there are so many kids growing up in broken households single parent households or you know just messed up houses in general and it's leading to this kind of excess in unhappy kids we see crime we see psychological issues we see more you know mental illness today and i think these are very very big factors um, in our current problems when it comes to children as well as families. And back in the you know, mid-1900s, we didn't have that exact same problem. John Calhoun also noted that the mice who were born very late in the study developed or acted quote-unquote autistic in some sense and that they didn't know how to really do a lot of basic things and 
obviously, as most people know, we're seeing the highest rates of autism right now, which was also not a thing in the mid 1900s or before. And it's just been on a steady increase, really, I believe, since the 70s. And that is obviously for a number of reasons. I won't go into it so that the video doesn't get censored, but it correlates with some very specific things. And when you have too much of everything, it does not end well for the population. One thing that's really important to remember that is said by John Calhoun in the study is that once the first death occurs, once the spirit has died, the second death will occur soon after. And in our current time period, we really need to be cognizant that we do not allow for the spirit to die or that we don't cause the first death. We are absolutely seeing that right now. We are, like I said earlier, living in a time of excess. We're living in a time of too much technology, as I heard somebody else say it. We are essentially primitive beings living with medieval institutions wielding godlike technology i saw that in the joe rogan podcast and i thought that was a really fantastic way of describing part of our current situation and i think that it's just getting a little bit crazier and crazier but reading this study and just being aware of something like this can kind of give you a glimpse at things that we should take note of and we can obviously see it in our culture. We can see it in our species. And it's something that we should probably change. Probably mice are not the same as humans. We are more complex, more self-aware. We are still animals to an extent, and we still run with a primitive brain in many senses, especially when it comes to reproduction and food and sleeping and all these things. So I think that we have the ability to change our course as long as more people wake up to the need for that. With that, I just want to say, let us protect the spirit. Let us protect the human spirit as well as animal spirits in general. I'm a believer in not harming other beings, any animal, and I think that's a big part of veganism for me and when you protect the spirit you know you're protecting your body as well but i think the spirit is the most important part so thank you guys for watching this video if you have any questions or comments just drop them down below if you could subscribe to this channel and like the video we'd really appreciate that it helps out a lot and we'll have more videos coming out soon thank you guys so much it is widely known that the tobacco and diet industries lobby governments with scientific propaganda for years until proven guilty in court. The artificial treatment of our water is the next corporate deception. For example, virtually every nation in Europe has rejected the use of artificial fluoride. International studies since the 40s have repeatedly shown that endocrine and neurological effects increase after repeated consumption, even at the levels accepted by U.S. government. Epic Water Filters is the most thorough industry-grade filtration system that Houston Ensemble has ever used. They reduce heavy metals upward of 99.5% such as lead and mercury, bacteria like E. coli, and poisons like chromium, nitrate, and fluoride. fluoride. Join us in our journey to living a toxin-free life and get your epic water filter using discount code Houston Ensemble lowercase one word. That's Houston Ensemble lowercase one word for 20% off your epic water filter.